Good evening, buenas noches. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and everyone at Books and Books, I'd like to welcome you to our virtual evening with James McBride to discuss and celebrate his magnificent new novel, Deacon King Kong, published by Riverhead Books. It's just been named Oprah's book club pick. Congratulations. I'll take a moment to give a shout out to all our friends at Riverhead Books who have been such wonderful, wonderful partners throughout the years and published so many great books. Thank you. James McBride is an accomplished musician and author whose books have been translated into 19 languages and sold millions of copies around the world. He's the author of the National Book Award winning and New York Times bestselling The Good Lord Bird, which Showtime is turning into a TV series. The best-selling American classic, The Color of Water, the bestsellers Song Yet Sung and Miracle at St. Anna, which was adapted into a film by Spike Lee with a screenplay written by McBride. He's also the author of Kill Him and Leave, a biography of James Brown, awarded a National Humanities Medal by President Obama for humanizing the complexities of discussing race in America. McBride is a distinguished writer in residence at New York University. In conversation with him this evening is Jason Reynolds, an award-winning and number one New York Times bestselling author. Jason's many books include Miles Morales, Spider-Man, the track series, Ghost, Patna, Sunny, and Lou, Long Way Down, which received a Newbery honor, a Prince, Don Prince honor, and a Coretta Scott King honor, and Look Both Ways, which was a National Book Award finalist. His latest book, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You is a collaboration with Ibram X. Kendi. He was recently named the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, and I was lucky enough to be in the audience at the U.S. Library of Congress when he was inaugurated before a room full of thousands of screaming students. It was a wonderful day indeed. Please remember you can ask any questions anytime during this broadcast by pressing the Ask a Question button on the bottom of the screen. You can order Deacon King Kong and any other of James and Jason's books on the button, on the button below. Every purchase helps Books and Books stay alive. And now, Without further ado, welcome. All right, hi everybody, how y'all doing? Good evening um, or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Uh, Mr. McBride, pleasure to see you, sir. Nice to see you also. So this is this is the way it's gonna run. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk, I'm gonna ask you some questions. We'll do about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll just break into the, you know, you've done this a million times as, as I, I know you have, um, and we'll get into the questions. For all the folks listening, please put your questions in the ask a question box so that I can see them and we can get to all the questions that you may have for Mr. McBride. I'm sure there are many uh, as he's a fascinating person. Here's how I want to start. First thing I want to say, I should get out the way, the formality. Uh, I am super grateful for the work you've done uh, over the years. And in my world, you're like to me, you're like the Bo Jackson of art. You know what I mean? You're like... You're like the only you're like the only person I know who's been able to exceed, uh, I mean, excel at at multiple disciplines. We all know you as as a writer, obviously at the moment, but we also know that you had uh, an illustrious career as a musician, uh, as a jazz musician, and you've somehow been able to sort of sit at the top of both mountains. Which I don't know, I don't know, and you could probably tell me. I'm not sure that's ever happened before, right? It's like you, Bo Jackson, Deion Sanders, like that's it, right? Like has anyone else ever done both things? Well, there was a guy, it was a wonderful musician named Art Taylor who played with uh, Sonny Rollins and Miles and John Coltrane. And he, he wrote a, a series of books called Notes and Tones. Hmm. And um, he interviewed all of these great jazz players. And uh, their, their talk to Art Taylor was really significant because he was one of them. So they didn't, they didn't, there was no, it was really a kind of a, a heart to heart discourse. And those books are, are really good. They can be found, I'm sure, at Books and Books. I'm sure that Books and Books can get hold of those books. Uh, but I don't know anybody who, who's kind of been my way uh, that is a musician and a writer, although there are some. There are some who, you know, some, some writers can play. I mean, there's a guy named Jeff Frank who used to work with me at the Washington Post, and he's a fabulous, he's a very fine novel, novelist, and he's a f very fine jazz guitar player, like a professional level player. 
Hmm. But I, you know, I don't. I mean, I, you know, only a few. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, you're like you're like I'm blessed. What can I say? You yeah, know? look, I'm lucky. I mean, you look, you've seen the worst side of me when I was carrying on like a like a bellowing like a cow when I first got on this computer thing because I I didn't know what to do. You know, I mean. I mean, you know, look, just because you're talented don't mean you ain't human, right? It's all good, you know? Well, thank you. I appreciate that, especially from a talented young young writer like yourself, you know? I appreciate I, that. I appreciate it. Here, here's my question, and I know this question has been asked before, but I'm going to ask it anyway in hopes that, because, you, you know, we get asked this, you know, there are questions that come up often. Sometimes we give the same answer, and sometimes we tap into some other part of our psyche that we forgot about some other point. So I'm going to test it out and see. Okay. <laughs> All right, so James Brown, James Brown said, as I'm sure you know, that to him, every single instrument was a drum, right? In his mind, he looked at every instrument like a drum, right? Quincy Jones, Quincy Jones said, you know, he was, he always talked about how fascinated he is that we've been able to create so much with only 13 notes, right? And in the world of literature, we've been able to create, uh, I mean, we're talking about the old, one of the oldest art forms, and we've been using over the last however many centuries, just 26 letters. So my question to you is, what are the connections, right? And I know you've gotten this question a million times. I've seen some of your interviews and I've even been in the room uh, beforehand uh, with, with, um, uh, with uh, Good Lord Bird. What are the connections between music, for you, music and literature? Or what have you learned from music, like between the connection or connecting points between music and literature? Well, m well, music overall teaches you humility because there's always someone who can play better, who, who has a wider vocabulary who is always different, who is purer, um, and who just knows more. Uh, and the, the, and the, and the discipline of music helps you as a writer because, you know, music is a kind of cumulative skill. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a talent that's in one, but the skill part of it is cumulative. You learn, you know, you play an E flat and you learn a G and then you learn a B flat. That's an E flat major chord and so forth. And then you have to learn an E and then E you know, G sharp, B natural and so forth. So, but the cumulative part of storytelling, but the cumulative part of storytelling is not as uh, logical as music is, because storytelling um, is involves, you know, the seven plots that we all say have have been used again and again. But they really, it's really not about that for me, in my opinion. I think it's really about learning to expand on characters so that characters are, are true. And in order to make characters true, every character is different. So the skill set that's involved can involve anything. It can involve music or economics or, or graphic art. I mean, you, you're you someone who dances in all different types of storytelling. And mm -hmm. so you have to be able to speak Spanish, English, and Latin, and you have to throw in a little bit of French as well, because there are certain things that, there's certain muscles you use when you're dealing with graphic storytelling as opposed to just straight up and down narrative on on a white page there's no real map in that in there's no real map in that way there are just elements that you know you have to connect and in that regard music and literature are the same because you know that there are certain points in your story that that things just have to connect and you have to have the chops some kind of way to make them happen in music at least in jazz there's certain things you know you have to do, um, and bebop jazz, you know, boop bop and do that kind of jazz. Uh, in storytelling, in fiction at least, you, there are certain points you have to reach, but you're not necessarily having to state the melody and then solo and then state the melody again. You can sometimes just go straight out, flat out, and blow, and then state the melody later on. You reveal to the reader later on why we were here in the first place. So if you're good enough, you can keep them involved so that they'll figure out, they'll stay with your, your narrative until the end to figure out why they were there in the first place. So those are some of the connections. I always, I think about my, my uncle, you know, I grew up with a bunch of jazz men, you know, my uncles and, and my, my father and my mother and everybody sort of listening to jazz. And as a kid, it, it sounds, if you don't understand what you're listening to, uh, it, it can sound a bit dissonant. And, and you know, my uncle, you know, and my, because, because the beauty of jazz is that every instrument like they're all in sync and yet they're all doing a different thing. You know, right. and my, my, my uncles would say, well, you have to listen, right? Like you, you're not listening, right? And it's like, right. no, you know, they're like, no, no, you're hearing it, but you're not listening to what to what's being played. And I think 
when I think about literature, when I think about your literature, I think so much of it has to do with your your ability to 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 listen to the characters that you're dealing with, to listen to the world around you. Uh, I think about uh, minor chords, right? The idea of the minor chord and how and how we can use music to set tone, to set mood, right? And and what the minor chord does in terms of the mood, like or, or the blue note, the idea of the blue note, right? And how when we're making the things we're making, something like Dick and King Kong how some of it feels this way, the sentiment, the mood of it, and some of it feels that way. And then lastly, I, I was, as a jazz man, I was thinking to myself, it feels like there are moments in the book, especially in the beginning, where, where you kind of let it, where, where it just kind of goes and goes and goes and then comes back to the one, right? And there's this moment, there's this epiphanic moment where you're like, oh, that's what King, that's what Deacon King Kong means. When, when, when we get the, the the moment where you sort of reveal what Deacon King Kong or what the King Kong in his name, where that actually comes from. But the, the the journey you take us on felt like it almost felt like that moment where you're like, are they gonna? Is he gonna come back to the one? Right? Is he, is he gonna come back? And when it happens, it's mind blowing. <laughs> well, you listen to a lot of music, obviously, and you listen to a lot of James Brown. But yeah, you're right. The, and one of my problems or one of my challenges, really is that sometimes a scene in fiction will get so good that I just want to let the characters keep talking. And, they, and if it gets funny, I'll stay with it, you know, and, they, and then it gets funnier and funnier. And I say, I got to pull out of this. It's not really, it's getting boring. It's too long. The reader's going to, you know, reach for the remote. But uh, sometimes it just gets so good. You want to stick, you want to stay with it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that is a, that is a problem. I, when I was in Africa many years ago, well, two things. I had a friend, I have a friend whose father was a, he's a, he's a, he's a very close friend of mine. He's Jewish and his parents were Holocaust survivors and his Holocaust survivors and his father played the mandolin and he was a good player. And I used to play with his father sometime. And we would play these, you know, like these Jewish songs. And I, and one day I said to him, why is, why, why is everything? And they were beautiful songs. And, but I said, why is everything, you know, we keep playing in these minor keys. And he said, and this guy was a Holocaust survivor. I mean, he was an extremely, he was a heavy cat, man, really brilliant dude. He said, Jewish life is in a minor key, my friend. Never forget that. And I just, I just thought that was very profound um, because you listen to a lot of Jewish players who play jazz and some of these cats are just extraordinary. If you listen to Yiddish, Yiddish music, for example, some of these players are just, it's just, it's just busting out of them. But the other part is going back to the one and going back to the statement of story. I was in Africa many years ago in Abidjan playing with her. No, I went to Abidjan. Was it Abidjan? No, Dakar. I was in Dakar. I went to Abidjan to play. and then But later I went to Senegal. I was talking to some musicians over there. And they said that the jazz drummer Roy Haynes was in Africa. And he got together with an African drum troupe to play. And, and so this guy, this guy was a master drummer and he assembled all these drummers and they started to play like boom, 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 boom. Now, if you're a musician, you understand that. Well, I'll explain to you what happened. So Roy Haynes tried to come in and he couldn't. He couldn't. Now, Roy Haynes is one of the greatest jazz drummers ever. He couldn't find a place to enter. So he stopped. And then he tried again and he stopped again. And then he tried again. The third time he just threw his sticks in there. He just like, started laughing. And so the master drummer told the drum, he, he communicated to the drummers to slow things down and to give him the one, give him the, the down, and they gave him the downbeat. And then Roy Haynes got in and they said, once he started playing with those guys and they took it up to the next level where they started doing these complicated polyrhythms, the guy said Roy Haynes went crazy. It was like he was suddenly free. He said he was incredible. He was just going wild. So in a story, now I can't, and I can't go there in a story. Tony Morrison can, you know. Tony uh, there's a writer named Jeffrey, I think his name is Jeff Allen. He lives in Virginia. He's, a, I mean, he's a superb cat. I wish I could remember his name. Um, he's a guy who can do that. African American. I kind of. He he wrote a a, a a novel about Blind Tom, a blind pianist. Hmm. Dude is bad. I mean, he just can. Some people can just pick the plane in the air and just shove it. Just you know, start flying. Uh, uh, the guy who wrote Dispatch is the guy who did it in nonfiction. Uh, he's the guy who just lift it up. I can't do that. I, I I need a runway, and you know, I need God's grace to get me going. <laughs> yeah, but but there's but that. But I will say this though that your 
your novel, your writing in general is still polyrhythmic, right? Like in Deacon King Kong, one 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 could say that that the polyrhythms in Deacon King Kong that one is the, is the rhythm of environment, one could be the the rhythm of humor, and I, and you, and you touched on humor for a moment, and I and I, I have. What I love most probably about your work, other than the um, other than the sort of audacious creativity is the humor. And I've been having conversations. I'm of the so like me and all my partners in, in this in, in, in our era, we're having these arguments about like what exactly is a literary novel, right? Th these are these sort of ridiculous conversations that you probably don't give a damn about because you probably shouldn't. But like these are these ridiculous conversations that are being had, me and my buddies, and everybody's like, well, there's Toni Morrison, which we all know, right? But like, what makes something a literary novel? And I mean, recently I was having this conversation and I was like, yo, I think, I think that like it's gonna be like McBride's gonna be like, we're gonna see James McBride's novel is gonna be lifted up as as sort of things to look at as literary examples, right? And you know, it's interesting because when we say the word literary, we usually are talking about some strange arbitrary quality of form that really is attached to something old and white that we don't, that is long gone and we use it as some strange standard. And I always question, why is it that humor can't be a major cornerstone of that which is literary when it's a major, major linchpin in all of our lives? And so I just want to touch on like, why? Like, what is the re your relationship uh, to, I mean, you, you, you're like, you're like persistent with humor, you know? Well, look, if I didn't have humor, I couldn't. Look, I, 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 they, in, in my church, they laugh all the time. I go to a little Baptist church, you know, and they're laughing all the time. Now, people often laugh at church people, and there's a lot to laugh about at church people, you know, because they do some stupid stuff. But, but mostly, for me anyway, the, the act of being part of the church is a humorous act because people are looking for something to laugh at. You know, when something bad happens, the instinct for at least the older people in my church, which I'm slowly becoming one of them, is to just laugh at it because there's nothing you can do to stop it. You can't you can't change it. You just learn to laugh. And there's a lot in that laughter. There's bitterness, there's, there's joy, there's hope, there's redemption. Um, humor is the connective tissue that keeps us together as, as people. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that I think if you're going to be an effective writer that writes to readers who are not just African-American, which is a problem for many talented African-American writers, including yourself, mm -hmm. you've got to be funny. Because if you're not, people pick up your work and they just think you're like giving them you better take your medicine type of literature, which is really unfair and which is really a hurdle that every African-American and to some degree, Latino writer has to, uh, Latino writer of, of, of culture and, and identity has to deal with. And that's really a very difficult hurdle to cross. Mm. I, I remember John Williams talked about that to me many years ago when I was a young writer. John A. Williams, who wrote The Man Wait, 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 wait. You knew he, John A. Williams? I met him. Yes, I did. I interviewed him when I was 20 three or 24 years old at the Boston Globe. He had a book out and he came to Boston and I interviewed him and, and he was so, well, you know, you got the impression when you read about him or heard about him that he was this angry man who was like, you know, just like cussing white people out. He wasn't like that at all. He was a gentle, kind, deeply profound, good person. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but he mentioned that, you know, he mentioned that, you know, in his career that that he was he felt he always felt he was seen as a kind of an angry person. Well, his colleagues at Rutgers loved him. I mean, he was really I mean, it's a shame that even now after his death, I have to say to tell people John A. Williams was a really first of all, he was an, talk about literary, literary, right? Literature. This was a guy who could put it together. One of the best. Um, one of the best and relatively unknown. Absolutely. Some um, Sons of Light, one of the greatest novels I've ever read. Which one? Sons of Darkness, Sons of Light. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, he was, I tell you, I mean, there's several, there, there are a couple like that. Um, angry Ones. Angry Ones. Um, the Man Who Cried I Am. The Man Who Cried I Am. <laughs> uh, did he write The Spook Who Sat By The Door? No, that was. Um, I Am Greedy. Okay, right. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, 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 I digress, as they say. Um Man. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he, he mentioned that, that, you know, you have to, 
you're going to have to get used to that idea that, you know, you can't leave whatever your identity is purported to be, even though you are more than what you look like. Hmm. You know, you can't be trapped by that. I, I, I just remember so well how he was such a big person. He was, you know, and how he was so well read. He read everyone. Yeah. And he really loved writing. He loved writers and he loved writing and he and he loved the community that produced him. Um, of everybody, I think he's probably the one person I, I when I when I found out about John A. Williams, I was probably in my early 20s and I tried to find him because no, you couldn't find him. No, he was I was in Brooklyn, living in Brooklyn. He was teaching at Rutgers. By the time I figured out he was teaching at Rutgers, for some reason, I thought that I had time to catch up with him. And of course, we lost him and I never got a chance to to shake his hand. You know? Well, I mean, um, one, what, one thing that happens when you get a little bit older, like me, I'm 62, is that you realize that you run out, you're running out of time. And I've, I've been lucky enough to meet some really fine, I met Kurt Vonnegut, I met E.L. Doctro, and uh, some of the really fine, and, they, and I always remember their kindness and their words of encouragement. So, uh, and then there's some that I met that people don't don't know, like uh, George Goodman, who was a writer at the New York Times. Uh, Thelani Davis, I never met her, but she's still alive, and she's another one that's Have really talented. Pete Hamill? Excuse me? Have you met Pete Hamill? Yeah, I know Pete Hamill very well. One yeah. <laughs> oh, man, he's one of the best. One of the best. The greatest. Pete Hamill is one of the greatest cool. American writers, uh, uh, quote me, ever. I mean, he is, he. the only reason why Pete Hamill is not recognized as a great literary figure, in my opinion, is because Pete Hamill worked all the time. You know, these Irish guys and these Irish people in New York, man, they work like slaves, man. They don't, <laughs> Pete Hamill, used, he worked like he had 18 jobs, man. And he was at the Daily News and New York Post, and, uh, screenplays, and, but he's written excellent novels. He's written excellent books. His memoirs, beautiful. I mean, that dude is no joke. Yeah, I just, I just, I was just going, I was just pulled out a book that he wrote today. I just, I was on my shelf. It's called Invisible City, story sketches of New York life. You know, he was all, he's also a painter. I didn't know that. Yeah, he went to Pratt as a painting student. His his story, Drinking Life, is an excellent. In yeah. fact, if you read Drinking Life, you see little bits of it in Deacon King Kong. Like Deacon King Kong mentions Radigan's. That was actually Pete Hamill. <laughs> that was yeah, Pete Hamill. Man. I, I love Hamill. I want to. I want. So speaking of Pete Hamill, speaking of of Brooklyn, you know, like I, I, I believe that some of the best novels and the best stories we tell are when we sort of personify the environment, when we turn the environment into a character in the book. Uh, you you uh, uh, use the Cause projects and 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 I know you're 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 a Red Hook guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're you're. Yeah, and Red Hook, and 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 I'm curious about Brooklyn. I, I lived in Brooklyn for 15 years. I uh, loved it, loved it, loved it dearly. It would always be a special place to me. I'm not there anymore, um, but I'm glad I did my time in Brooklyn. But you, as a Brooklyn native, born and bred Brooklyn guy, uh, a Red Hook guy, Red, and Red Hook is fascinating for so many reasons. I mean, when I was in Brooklyn, Red Hook felt so far. I lived in Bed Stuy. Red Hook felt so far away, right? It, it, yeah. it felt so far. It felt like an island. Uh, unto itself, um, yeah. you know, and to, like I feel like nobody went there unless you lived there until they put the IKEA down there, and then right. Like, you know, right. <laughs> like, yeah. right. You're yeah. like I got a red hook now, like. <laughs> and so I guess I just want you to talk, and and, and what you do in the story, um, for those of you who haven't read it yet, the, the beauty of of the environment of this book is that you sort of show us the onion rings, right? You show us that like there's this, and then there's like the outskirts. Of, of cause and these other these 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 other communities and the interconnectedness of New York City of our cultures uh, the fabric work that that it builds but you turn it almost feels like like cause the cause project the cause housing projects is a character amongst itself like Brooklyn always feels to be alive to me. Well, well Brooklyn is a, is a world unto itself. You mentioned Pete Hamill. Who he is the he should be the Brooklyn. But I mean, he is the the white literary version of Spike Lee and, and some, because he knows Brooklyn, him and his brother, all those Hamels were talented. His, his brother, Dennis Hamill is also very talented as well. And he's another Brooklyn guy, but you know, Red Hook was, was isolated until the Ikea came, but 
I think the whole point of, of, of the cause houses and using this whole business of a housing project as a place to base the story is that because most people see Red Hook and places like Red Hook from behind the wheel of a tightly locked car. Yep. They drive through, they say, I'm not going there. And they look out the window and they see, and they just don't understand what they're seeing. They're seeing a village. Uh, it was a village in the 40s when it was first built for Italian workers who dock workers. And then when they left and the Latinos and the, the African-Americans came, it, it still remained a village. And there's just a lot of humanity there. Um, and of course, the 80s was a difficult time because crack just decimated Red Hook like it decimated Bed-Stuy and all those other areas. But I've always had so much fun there. I mean, I, really, I've, I've never, I mean, part because my parents started, you know, a church there. And so I always had a connected connection to the community that way. But I've never, you know, I've never, my mother loved Red Hook. You know, my mother was white. She was one of the few white people walking around Red Hook in the 80s. We used to get mad at her for going to Red Hook. We said, you're going to get killed there. But she, nothing ever happened because all she'd do, she'd call a friend from a pay phone and the friend would send a son down and he'd walk into, you know, at worst, she'd have to get walked to the subway. And um, she she never felt fear there. I mean, it, it's just a place where people live. Sometimes yeah. bad things happen. I mean, they, have, they can happen anywhere. Um, so much of So much of what we do, you and I, has to do with how we view the world. And... One of the things I like about your, your work, Spider-Man particularly, is that Miles Morales is one of the really finest characters in the graphic arts world, partly because he inhabits a world that I don't really know that well at all. Hmm. You know, my generation, we didn't grow up with, I mean, I had white friends as a kid at school, you know, and I had, you know, one like Asian friend, but we didn't have this multi-dimensional world where people actually didn't know how to factor in racism because they weren't that tuned to it. They just were like, well, when, I don't know if that's right or not. You know, they, just, <laughs> they, they, they didn't have that plugged in sense of superiority that black characters had the black people really had to fight off. And so that's something that that's a burden. That's a weight. That's an anvil that my generation carries that your generation really doesn't really doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't really have unless they choose to carry it as weight as opposed yeah. to as a as a useful literary tool. I think we're and I know I, I, I've I'm, I'm a fan, so I've know my done my homework, and I know for you you're anti cynicism, and I think our our generation is definitely reticent, right? We're skeptical, um, but I think a lot of us have worked really hard to shirk off cynicism. Uh, and hopefully well, I got that from Pete. Let me tell you something. I heard when Pete Hamill came to visit my class at NYU about 10 years ago. And he spoke for about 15 minutes. And I'm telling you, he said more in those 15 minutes than I said in 15 weeks of class. And one of the things he said mm -hmm. was, cynicism is a killer of creativity. It's okay to be, it's, it's okay to be skeptical, but cynicism will dice your dreams to bits because you all you you do something and you'll say someone has done it before I'm not going to do it and I don't I I don't know what happened to those students in that class but I know what happened to me <laughs> I said, well I'll, I'll keep that in my mind hey <laughs> hey I'm, you and I both both I want to I want to ask just a few more and then we'll get to to the to the questions from the people that matter most which are the people who are, who come to read your books and everything um so when I read this novel, so first of all, I had this novel for a very long time. They sent it to me. I, I was on the set of um, CBS This Morning or something, and they had it as a prop before it came out. And I, and I took it off the shelf and <laughs> told them on set and told them, I'm going to go ahead and take this one. I'm going to go ahead and take this one with me. And uh, when I read it, it felt like reading a story of all of my uncles. And uh, the nicknames, the, the, the bickering, the, the humor, this sort, of, I, 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 this sort of unspoken understanding, even in the midst of like, the, the, like there's, a, there's a blade to the way people are in this story, but it's an unspoken sort of love and affection. Uh, and I'm most fascinated, one, by Sport Coat, of course, by Deans, who, who, sort, of, who sort of catalyzes the entire story 
But then at the end, and I don't want to spoil it for those who have yet to read it, though it's been out for a while now. I don't know what's taking y'all so long. Um, but Dean's and, and the this, this story arc of this character. But the best character, man, for me, had got to be Elefante. Wow. Yo. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I just had a conversation about Elefante. Um, look, it's so refreshing to be able to write characters that are not Black and who are interesting and who you feel enormous empathy for, and maybe you have an in. And, I, you know, so you work a little bit harder at those because I don't know that much about Italians and Italy. I mean, I lived in Italy when I wrote Miracle at St. Anna. Mm. And, uh, and you know, I, I grew up in New York, so all of us who grew up in New York, we all have some Italian friends, some Italian connections. But I loved Alfante too, in part because I love Mario Puzo. And Mario Puzo, and that was really, the, that was really my, my big concern that, I didn't want to trip over Mario Puzo's entrails because not entra of his pigtails, or I don't want to trip over his feet because he he say, he has some big feet in a literary talk about a literary novelist. Oh man, he was a he was he one of the for, for, for the audience members, this is the man who wrote The Godfather. Right, right. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and also that 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 era of New York ethnic person who was not black, like. E.L. Dockshaw, Mario Puzo, Pete Hamill, those guys really, you know, um, they really understood what was important. In any case, yeah, I, I really liked Elefante a lot. I, and, I, and a lot of his conflicts were conflicts that I that I could relate to, you know, despite the fact that I'm not Italian. Yeah. Um, and there's a big Italian presence in Brooklyn that's really, that's not written about that much. I mean, there's a lot about Brooklyn that's not written about that much. Hmm. Um, and in part because going back to what you said before, um, there's, a, there's a lot of about, about culture that is, that is understood amongst those who live in the culture but not communicated effectively. E.L. Doxo does it really well with, with Jewish people. Pete Hamill does it well with, with pretty much all people. And I like to think that, um, um, uh, who was the other writer? In any case, there are a lot of misunderstoods. We all have an uncle who was crazy and who right. drank too much. Right. We all have an aunt who had four husbands and took out her teeth and she was still beautiful at age 60 and they were still chasing her around. <laughs> exactly. You know? So yeah. I just, I love those kinds of characters. Yeah, I just, I, I, I mean, when, I, when we were kids, teenagers in DC, uh, we would steal hubcaps and sell them for money. Uh, and uh, when reading Elefante, it was like, it's refreshing to read the hooligan as human, right? That, that right? Because there's always this, uh, we, uh, America, is, America is the land of the binary. You have the winner and the loser, the victor and the, 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 the villain and the hero, right? There's always this strange bifurcation that doesn't actually exist in our lives. We're all a bunch right. of journey folk just doing the best we can. Man, right, and right, to see right. Elefante, not a bad guy, is a dangerous man, but is not a bad guy simultaneously. And to root for him in some strange way is was just uh, first of all was masterfully done, and also uh, is necessary. And by the way, it's not just Elefante. Deems is not a bad kid. He's not a bad dude. Sport coat was a good dude. Like. The, the complexity of our lives, I think you do a, uh, an incredible job of, of using a, a, a deft hand to write human beings and not caricatures of human beings. Well, thank you. That means a lot to me. That's really what I hope, you know, I hope, uh, that's what I hope to accomplish because, I, you know, um, all of us know, you know, so many of these young men are in prison now. It's so, I mean, a lot of the young men I know who, who are my age are dead and they were killed by, you know, lots of things, AIDS and all kinds of stuff. But um, uh, there's not a lot that separates us, really. Um, and, you know, someone who's, listen, if I punch someone in the face, that's called assault. And then cop comes and now I have a record for assault. Well, I shouldn't have punched someone in the face, but I mean, you, you know, you have to you have to give people room to say I made a mistake. Right. And if you do that, you'll find humans all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. 
let's get to some of the questions because uh, I don't. I know everyone's probably like, I want to talk. I, I have a question, so I want to make sure I, I honor the folks who have come to see you. All right, question number one. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the symbolism. Okay, so this is not about, this is going to be interesting, but I'm going to ask it because I want to honor this person. I uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the symbolism of I can't breathe in U.S. history and what those words mean to you. Well, I try not to to, to dig too deeply into um, the, 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 the business of now, and I try to look at the bigger picture. Um, I can't bring myself to look at uh, George Floyd dying. I think it's more important that I work hard so that people will vote and do the right thing in terms of what what's ahead. Otherwise, I think you you know you th because if we don't vote, he died for nothing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really. I, I wish I could answer that person's question better. I I don't I don't indulge in that kind of symbolic uh, business because I, I I don't think it's healthy. I'm interested in solutions and not and not going over the problem again and again. We know the problem has existed as long as I've been living, but now we just see it better because God has made that possible. Um, so I think the the real question is, you know, how do we restructure the criminal justice system okay. so that it's more so that our, our needs as African Americans is, uh, is met fairly and squarely. Um, I would say that that would be my answer. I hope that's an yeah. appropriate one for the person who wrote. That's your answer, brother. That, that's going to be the answer. All, all I all I will offer, though, is that I think America is obsessed with symbols. And I think because we're obsessed with symbols, we sometimes uh, it sometimes holds up the progress because so many of us settle once we get the symbol to lean on. Uh, so be easy with the symbol. You know, let, 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 like, 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 like Mr. McBride said, let's figure out how to get to the solution uh, and don't be distracted. Uh, by the comfort of the symbol, that's uh, you know that that's what I would offer. Uh, number well, that's two, not, that's why you, that's 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 why young writers like you need to you know be at, be out here because you you you're, you're saying something I never even thought of. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's true. I you know you, you you can't follow the chatter. You have to follow. You have to guide yourself to what needs to happen. What do we need to do now? Okay, that happened. Now, what do we need? Do we know what the problem is. Let's just work on the solutions. Absolutely. Uh, okay. I would like to know what both of you have been reading lately. Thanks for your amazing work. Oh, geez. Um, you know, reading lately? Um, yeah, I just started a book. Let me just see if I can remember. What is it? Um, um, oh, geez. Um, I can't remember. I'm sorry, man. I, I can't remember. I, I was putting up a fence all day. Um, you want me to look? No, nah, I mean, should I look? Look. All right. <laughs> look, look, look. I'll, I'll answer the question. You look. All right. Oh, wait. Here's one right here. I'm reading one, th one right here. This is a. This is called Reefer Madness. I read like five books at a time. I just read. I read a lot of history books. I read five books at a time. But this is one. I, I'll go look at the other few. All right. So what I'm reading right now, uh, Macy Card, These Ghosts of Family, which is brilliant. I'm reading this book right here by the great poet Nikki Finney. This is her latest book. It's beautiful. Has all sorts of uh, memorabilia and ephemera on the inside of it from her life, as well as poems and context around said poems. It's a masterful piece of work and a beautiful object. And then I'm also reading over and over again this book right here. It's called Black Imagination by Natasha Marin. And it's interesting because it's kind of a collection of just thoughts from people who aren't famous and aren't writers. Uh, and it's just really cool. Check it out. It's called Black Imagination. Check that okay. out. Okay. All right. What you got? I'm reading this book. This is called um, Automats, Taxi Dances, and Vaudeville. It's by David Freeland. It's about old New York. I'm reading this book because I'm working on a new novel, and this book is just a reference book. It's called The Gay and Lesbian Theatrical Legacy. It's by uh, Billy Harbin, Kim Mara, and Robert Schenke. And I love this book. It's by uh, Robert Maravich. It's called uh, A City Called Heaven, Chicago, and the Birth of Gospel Music. Mm. My, my buddy from college was Aretha Franklin's conductor. Jeez. And uh, when he got married, I went to his wedding. 
And it was in, in Chicago, one of them big churches, you know. So at the wedding, um, this guy walked up, like his name is Fred Nelson, that's my friend. And um, this guy walked up and he played the piano and he sang a song. He was like, first of all, the band was just out. You know, those cats from Chicago, they really, I mean, if you're gonna play gospel or the blues, you better not go to Chicago. You're gonna get your feelings hurt. <laughs> them cats were kicking it. So anyway, this guy got up and he played a song and he sang and it was a beautiful song. So I said to him, I said to him afterwards, I said, look, I wanna record that song someday. He said, okay, so when I got picked by the Oprah Book Club, I did a video of my kids in Brooklyn and we were supposed to sing that song. Mm -hmm. But when I contacted the guy, he just went radio silent on me. I offered him money. He, he just, so the day before the recording, I, I went into my old, some of the songs I've written years ago and I found a song that I hadn't listened to in years because the guy had, the singer of it was a friend and he had passed away. I, I didn't like to think about it, but I pulled the song out and I did the song with these kids uh, from my church in, in Brooklyn, and it worked out great. You can see it if you go to the Instagram uh, thing on what I don't know how to do that, but if you go to the Instagram thing on the Oprah Book Club, you'll see these kids singing this song. And so, um, but I don't know why I started talking about that. You asked about the book, the gospel book. Oh, 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 because because everything I've learned in music really, my musical life started out as gospel. You know, we listen to gospel music growing up. We listen to the old times from the 50s because my mother and father, you yeah. know, they came up in the 50s, the 40s, and especially the 50s, the gospel music was just. What's the, what's the name of the group that's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain? I don't know. Now you, you uh, man, about that time. It, well, you're down there and uh, you're down there in Bernice Reagan territory. You know, she's a, the great gospel. She, she's really a great musician and a great. I was on the I was on the, on, the, on the email with her daughter an hour before I got on here with you. Is she still alive? Is she oh, okay? She all right. She all right. She her, I read her book too. Her book. Her book is called. Um, I just finished reading her book. It's a little red book. If you don't bother, don't. It's a little red book about her life growing up because she was a big. She sang during the. So, you know, I did a project with um, uh, the um, Taylor Branch. Parting the Waters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's all in his book because she was part of that freedom movement, singing in the South. She created a lot of the spirituals that were sung during the, you probably know, probably know all this. She's one of the great ones. All that sweet honey in the rock stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Taylor Branch, Taylor Branch, oh, you know, you're a Baltimore dude. Taylor Branch up in Baltimore chilling out. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a great, another great one. Yeah. Uh, one of the, another one of the, one of the, the greatest. Absolutely. In terms of, in terms of historical nonfiction, there's no one that I can think of this better. Absolutely. All right. Somebody wants to know, uh, let's see. Dickin King Kong is such a unique character. Is he a composite of many people you've met? One person or conjured up mostly from your, okay. Or is he one person that you conjured up mostly from your imagination? No, he's a composite. He's a composite. I've met several people who are like him, who have qualities like him and so forth. That's awesome. All right, this person wants to know, what does the writing process look like for James McBride? That's a good question. Well, I go to bed at 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and I start writing. 4 a.m. 4 a.m. and I get it, I get going and I usually around six or so, lately. I usually go from about four to six and then I quit, eat breakfast, work out a little bit, go a little more as far as I can and that's it. You know. do, you, do, you, do you still pick up your horn? Uh, no, the horn's sitting there. I just got it overhauled, uh, but I can't get anybody to come around here and play. I play more piano these days gotcha. um, because uh, I teach piano at the church. So uh, we just uh, we just broke for the summer. We start again in August. But there's nowhere to, where I'm going to play. Right. But you mean you, you got know? practice in the house? You play in the house? Yeah, but you know something? I've always hated practicing. I've always hated practicing. I never liked to play. Even in college, I hated practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody on this or watching us who is like, he hates to practice. One of the greats and he hates to practice. No, no, no. I mean, now listen to me just say, if I was playing for a living, when I was playing for a living, when I was in Jimmy Scott's band, I practiced all the time. Where? Because, you know, you got, look, I mean, in DC, we played DC two or three times. That was not DC. I played DC Space, but the other one, Blues Alley. Yeah, blues out. We play, man. You know, you when you're playing DC. I mean, you know, 
you could, there's like five guys sitting in the audience who can play better than you. I mean, that's Howard's down there and, you know, Morgan State. You got some players. Everybody, that, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, here we go. It says, uh, this is a question from a woman named Lisa. I'm biracial, bicultural, and bilingual. I have come to accept it as a blessing, but I still feel cursed at times. Not many are in my tribe. Would love your thoughts on biracial identity. Well, that just hurts my heart to hear that, you know, because Lisa is a special person. And, I, you know, this whole business of biracial is that there was a time when biracial meant you were just a beautiful person. You were physically gorgeous. Your hair hung down you to your back of your neck. You could make a ponytail to you know, to all the way to all the way to your glutus maximus. And, you know, it was just. And now, wait a minute. They got ugly biracial people, too, like me. What am I, you know? <laughs> Um, you just have to think of yourself as the best of both worlds. I mean, um, I, I've always, for me personally, African-American life has always been a place of comfort for me because it was a place of comfort for my mother. But for like, for what, for like my sisters, like my oldest sister, for example, um, she feels more comfortable really, you know, circling in the Jewish sort of sense of self and sense of purpose and sense of belief and whatever works for you works for you right. when you're bi when you're biracial you have to carve your own niche in the mountain and you'll realize that one day that you're not you're not hanging on by your fingernails but that you've created a whole city mm. and so just enjoy the enjoy the vision and enjoy the view you're not hanging on you're not caught between two worlds you're a world and the people in your world if you have a beautiful worldview, they will be beautiful mm. and they will bring you great source of comfort. So I urge Lisa to remember that she represents the best of both worlds. And and, and if people don't appreciate that. Then then this, as George Benson would say, find new friends. You know, they said that George Benson, the guitar player, mm -hmm. they said, you know, when you became a pop musician, all your jazz friends, a lot of your jazz friends turned away from this. You were going to pop. And George Benson said, he said, that's true. You lose a lot of new friends. You, you lose a lot of friends. He said, but then you make new ones too. So it all evens out. It all evens out. Yeah. I, you know, I think about at least the question such an interesting question. And I'm not biracial, um, but I find it, I always find it interesting when we have conversations around identity because I think that we all have so many identities within us, all of us. Like everybody is polylithic, right? Individually, right? Like mm -hmm. I, there are so many Jasons inside this, this shell. Right. We I'm trying to figure out how to get all of them to, to sort of show all of them to the world. But there are so many parts of who I am that exist within one individual space that allows me, like, like you said, that allows me to be a singular world. You know what I mean? Like what an amazing. Listen, what's the difference between John A. Williams and Pete Hamill? Nothing. Nothing. They're both kind, extremely gifted writers who didn't get enough attention. Yeah. One's yeah. black, one's white. Yeah. The world. Pardon me? Who, could, who had incredible sight, who could see the world, you know? Who could see the world cleanly. cleanly. Seeing yeah. the world cleanly means when someone says, you, uses terms about race, you understand, there's a part of you that understands that there's no black person in this country who's at pure African. If you can name me one pure African, Af African American, I'll give you $100 right now. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, <That's good. laughs> I mean, you can't, you, you can't look at it that way, man. God loves us all. He's not paying attention to that. He's not going to check your, no, you don't check a box when you go to heaven. Mm. If you get there, mm. you have to just do the sun Ra thing. Just there's a universal truth. I'm going to Saturn. Here I come. <laughs> Anyone wants to ride, you know, look, Speaking. it's so much easier to love. Now, it, it, love just disarms everybody, really. Yeah. Yeah. And um, let people say whatever they want. Hey man, what people think of you is none of your business. You know, as, as my mother right. said. Right. <laughs> my mother right. said. Right. All right, good question. We got a few more minutes. I want to get as many as I can. By the way, uh, the orchestra is getting back to work. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, Mr. No. Yeah, yeah. They announced it last week that they're about to start recording something, which I'm fascinated by. We'll see how that goes. Um, okay, this question is: What process do you all utilize to develop characters that resonate to your readers, like a rhythm and a mood? What process do you all utilize to develop characters? Well, I, I read tons and tons of books and I walk the earth, you know, I walk around 
and I talk to people and I always let people talk. I never tell people I'm a writer. I never tell them what, what I do. That's one of the advantages you have being a writer. Most people don't recognize you. Um, you listen hard and you try to, and you, and your favorite, your favorite phrase is, is that right? <laughs> is that right? And you just let, cause people are giving you, they are giving you money when they talk to you. It's true. And if you're smart, you'll listen and accept their gifts. That's awesome. Is, is yeah. that right? I'm going to start using that. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? I, I think for me, you know, I'm one of the people who feel like I do my best to create something that feels real. And then at some point, and I'm sure you've had these experiences where at some point the characters sort of tell you what they want and where they want to go and what they want to do and who they want to be. And, what they, you know, it's like they sort of come to life, you know. Yeah. I When I used to hear writers say that, I used to say, oh, man, that's a fraud. But it's not. It's, it's true. You know, you can't have a priest pull out a gun and clear a room. He's just not going to do that, you know, unless he lost his mind somehow. Exactly. Um, uh, they become authentic and then they start p talking to you at night, you know, and and that that can be a problem because you sit up in the morning. You know, I, I you, you can't go to anywhere without a pen in your hand. I, I always have a pen. I always have a pen. I always have a piece of paper. Yeah, there you go. That's that's quite a pen you have there, young man. That's hey, a hey. best selling author's pen. I there. To myself. I know you're not going to lose that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no response for me. We'll go to the next question. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. I'm only up to the part where Deems is in the hospital, but how did you come up with the idea of the ants? It just seems like one more irritating and absurd item that those in the housing project have to deal with. And I think it's great you threw it in there. Also, can you tell us a little bit about your process, which you've already talked about? So talk about Deems and the ants. Well, I mean, I, I like Deems and I, and I thought it was important to show that a drug dealer is just not a drug dealer. He's a person who got caught up in the life. Yeah. But um, the ants, my church is across the street from the post office a post office. And we had a problem there because my church is the ladies who run my church and it's mostly ladies are squeaky clean people. So the church is always clean, but across the street, the post office, they have rats over there. And for a long time, the rats would just, you know, and we would complain. I finally started writing letters. I mean, strong letters, you know, and finally they, they fixed it. But for a while you would come out of church and the rats would be just like, and so I, t I, I used to argue with the guys over there. I used to, went over there, one of them went there, I said, you know, and I knew them all, and they didn't like the rats either, but they never seemed to get anything because the manager would quit. I said to one of the guys, I said, listen, you know, we got kids running in out here. Why don't you do something about the rats? And he said, look, we put poison now. And then I said, there's a rat now that just jumped out just when we were talking. And he said, well, he just came out because you're here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was I was overwhelmed with the idea of, of the cars being off. If you look at a rat map of New York and you look at Red Hook and they show where the rats are, it's like totally red in, in the projects. But across the street, it's green. It's like, you know, yeah. the lettuce is better. The water is clear. I don't know. I mean, so I said, well, you know, and so I just came up with this, this whole notion of the ants attacking, you know. It's so good, man, because you could have easily gone the way of rats and roaches. But you know what I mean? Roaches seemed, every, everybody does roaches. Yeah, it's yeah. cliche, you know, so it was yeah. cool that you, that you did ask. That's the end of the questions. I have one, we have five minutes and I want to ask uh, just one or two really quick ones. Number number one is, I'm really fat. I've, I've, I know a bit about your story. I mean, I've read Color Water. And I, how much do you think, I mean, I find you to be a man with extraordinary grace. And, I'm, and what I mean by that is I think you have the ability to extend grace in a way that so many of us are losing these days. How much of this do you think has to do with faith? How much of it do you think has to do with being raised as one of 12? I mean, cause that, that changes the way you move around the world, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, a little bit of both. I mean, my, you know, my siblings and I don't live far from each other. We all, you know, when I was on CBS news, when the, when I did the Oprah thing, I was grinning so hard. My sister said, you know, you look like a moron. You know, she just said like right. <laughs> I mean, and so that kind of keeps you grounded. But also, you know, most of the people that I loved as a as a kid, my mother, my, my stepfather, my father passed away before I was born. My godparents who I was very close to. 
they never complained, man. They were so happy with what they had. And um, I'm ashamed that sometimes I'm complaining about stuff like, like, you know, when we first got started and I couldn't make this computer thing go and I was bellowing like a little calf about this computer business. I mean, I've, I've been given so much and um, there's nothing to complain about. There's only the work ahead. I mean, most of my life I've seen people who have who had, who've done, look, when I wrote The Color of Water, I used to tell my mother, you know, people really, she, she didn't even want to do interviews. She, she used to say, well, why don't you talk to the lady around the corner? She got 22 kids. <laughs> the lady around the corner had 22 kids. You know, I said, but, you know, people want to talk to you. Well, she, you know, and I don't know. I mean, um, um, you know, there was a racial component to that because, you know, she was a white woman, blah, blah, blah. But when she married my father, that wasn't the thing to do, you know. Um, uh, my the whole my whole my whole family's this way though. We're pretty down to earth, you know. We're lucky people. We're blessed. If we had come up now, we would not be as successful. Hmm. You can't make a mistake now as a young man. You know, you can't steal hubcaps now. You get shot. Yeah. You can't do the kinds of things that we did. You know, we backtracked a long way. So. People need to, the readers of my books need to understand, and the readers of your books and your work need to understand that if you and I were kids now, we probably would not become writers. We'd probably be in jail. At worst, at best, we'd be, you know, maybe school teachers or something like that. Sure. My last question, shout out to the school teachers, by the way. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, look, I, I, mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm not saying, yeah. Absolutely. We, so. That's why. That's the reason why we we're grateful for Yahoo, too. Well, no, I, I mean, let me clean that up. <laughs> you know, I am still in touch with my high school guidance counselor, who at 90 emailed me yesterday. I wow. still go, I, I can't go see him now because of the COVID, but so I'm, I'm very well aware of what teachers. Absolutely. You know. My last question before we get out of here is you're, and, and this, I don't know if this matters to you, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You're the, you're the Oprah book club pick. And, uh, my question is, Oprah called you? She called you on the phone or not? She ain't. Man, I was sitting there minding my own business, eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The, you know, the publisher said, you know, you got to pick up your phone because somebody, blah, blah, blah. but I never pick up my phone. But they said, pick up the phone because somebody needs to fact check a story for the Oprah magazine. So I said, all right. So, so I, that night I picked up the phone and I, someone said, James McBride. Said, yeah. She said, this is Oprah Winfrey. And, and I recognized her voice right away. And I got quiet, man. <laughs> I got real quiet. <laughs> I didn't say. I said, "What did I do?" I just. I was. I was just silent for like ten seconds, and then, <laughs> and then we chatted. You know, she was. She was very nice. You know, she's a very. Um, look, she didn't get to where she is by being. Um, she is very approachable, and she's very down to earth. So I was just delighted to hear from her, and I had a chance to thank her for what she's done for. Uh, not just for me, for, but for the publishing world, you know, for the publishing community. Sure. There are people who have done a lot for our community that really deserve, you know, thanks for it. And she's one of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man. That's cool, man. I, 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 I always wondered if she was the one who made the call, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had it all set up. I didn't know, you know, it was a surprise. And I didn't know how, I didn't know why she was calling me. You know, I, I really didn't. I, I was like, and then she she started chatting, and then she then at some point she said, "Well, we're gonna make it a book club selection." And I was like, you know, I was like this boy, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> boy!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey man, moments of joy still matter, right? Wow. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Well, look, I want to say uh, on behalf of myself as a reader and as a writer and as a young, uh, somebody coming up and and looking at you and looking at. Uh, some of my other, you know, people that I look to as, as a standard for me and the work that I'm doing and I'm trying to continue to do. I want to say thank you earnestly. I want to say thank you for what you've done and, and for this book and for all the work. And uh, yeah, man. And I'm glad I got an opportunity to do this, you know? Well, thank you very much. I, I, you were very gracious uh, uh, at the beginning when I was acting like a little 12 year old and I couldn't figure out how to get on this. So I appreciate your kindness and, and, and your talent as well. Thank you very much. Everybody, this is James McBride. We're talking about King King Kong. Go get the book. You can buy it. The, the link is right there. You can purchase it right there. Uh, and yeah, thanks for books and books. So I just want to thank both of you. Um, you're amazing. Mitchell called me during the broadcast and he's like, 
I could listen to this like all day and all night. I wish we didn't have a time limit. Thank you so much for joining us at Books and Books. I've been listening to a lot of Stevie Wonder and there's this one song, Overjoyed. And mm -hmm. if you listen to the lyrics of that song, that's how I feel about this night. So thank you so much for being with us and um, right. stay safe. And I hope that we'll see you again soon in Miami at Books and Books, at the book fair and uh, stay well, keep doing what you do. Love, right. love to you both. All right, thank you. All right, brother.